Hello, everyone. This is Braswell Dean, Family Medicine, and we're going to be talking today about Nutrition Concepts Part 2. This is a continuation of our earlier talk, Nutrition Concepts Part 1, and one of the big points that we were making then is there's really an explosion of diabetes and obesity, and um, as this ex- this tremendous explosion this healthcare crisis occurs i think family doctors more and more are finding themselves right in the middle of it and there really should be no group of doctors more comfortable talking with their patients about nutrition than your family doctor so i really from that perspective i want us to to dive in a little bit and look at some of the metabolic medicine, some of the concepts that I think are really, really important for you, not only for boards, but for your whole practice as well. So we're going to continue what we built on last time. And I'd like to start today with metabolic syndrome. We kind of know what metabolic syndrome is. We, we talk a little bit about it. It's pr- there's probably a board question or two on that. Um, it used to be called syndrome X when I was coming through school. Now it's like metabolic syndrome. So I wanted to start there and, and build on that for a minute. Now, if you're looking for lab criteria as to what metabolic syndrome is, perhaps for the boards or for your own knowledge base, um, it's got one low thing and four things that are up. So high, um, HDL cholesterol is low. Um, then you've got triglycerides, blood sugar, blood pressure, and the patient's weight all being elevated. Um, notice it doesn't include the LDL cholesterol. So that's your metabolic syndrome. So are we really on the lookout for that? Can we really explain the biochemistry of that, the physiology of that? Well, that's what this talk is going to be focused on. We're going to get our hands into this metabolic syndrome and review some physiology, review review a little biochemistry. And, um, you know, some of the things that I wish I had learned a little earlier in my career, um, because it would it just makes um, treating folks a lot of fun when you can really help them metabolically. Now, from our last talk in part one, we talked about hyperinsulinemia and the constant exposure of sugar and what that does to serum insulin. And it causes the body to have higher and higher insulin levels progressively over the years. And over the years, the cells become more and more insulin resistant. And then after a while, you get, a, even even though paradoxically you have higher and higher insulin levels, that you begin to get hyperglycemia. Why? Because the cells themselves are resistant to the insulin. You get residual sugar left over in the bloodstream. And then you begin to see um, pre-diabetes and then diabetes actually declaring itself. So sometimes, you know, you see the, the, the blood sugar and sometimes you don't. The point being that hyperinsulinemia starts um, many years before you begin to see elevation in blood sugar. And as insulin resistance increases, um, then you begin to, uh, the, the, the whole metabolic syndrome begins to manifest itself. And one of those manifestations is elevated blood sugar. So another point being, if we wait until we start seeing blood sugar elevation, we're missing some of the early uh, things that we could correct. Now, as time goes on, the liver becomes more and more insulin resistant, as do the cells. And the insulin's job is to try to store excess overflow blood sugar in the form of glycogen. So glucose is transformed to glycogen as storage. And uh, in between meals, if blood sugar drops, the liver can throw out glycogen back in the form of glucose. And then that's how the the liver really regulates blood sugar. But as new energy comes in, and, and it's useful to think of energy in the form of carbohydrate energy, 
Um, we could, we'll talk about um, fat energy separately, but, but just for now, as new energy, we're focusing on the insulin issue, as new energy comes in in the form of sugar, carbohydrate, um, as the liver becomes maximally storage, uh, as the storage becomes maximal in the liver, this the liver is faced with a dilemma. It's got to put this energy somewhere. And so it ends up saying, hey, you know what? I got to store this stuff. I can't store it anymore as blood sugar or, or as, or as a glycogen. So I'm going to convert it now to, to triglyceride. And that's what the liver does. The liver converts excess carbohydrate now to triglyceride. And that's amazing to me. That is an amazing biochemical feat. The liver can can really perform a, a metabolic miracle. So now you've got excess triglyceride being stored in the liver, and the liver says, I can't function this way. I've got to get rid of this excess triglyceride because if not, I'm going to get fatty liver disease. So the liver, to fight off this extra, you know, surge in triglycerides, it starts packaging the triglycerides into VLDLs for export. So the liver begins an export-import business, believe it or not. So we're exporting energy in the form of VLDL to the body. Fatty acids then get distributed to the muscles because the free fatty acids are quick energy. So the v as the VLDL begins to be metabolized and, and give off free fatty acids, the VLDL begins to shrink, okay, and get smaller and smaller. Intermediate density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins, you kind of know all those things. And then excess triglyceride eventually, um, the leftover triglyceride is packaged back up to import back to the liver because we, we can't waste any energy. So the... Um, Excess triglyceride is brought back to the liver in HDL. It's your sort of um, energy conservation apolipoprotein. And uh, then the, um, uh, but the, the problem is, is HDL is not made to transfer uh, all this triglyceride. So it gets damaged in the process, oxidized by the triglyceride, and it gets oxidized and damaged by the hyperinsulinemia. So you have a HDL issue as a result of all this extra energy that you're trying to get rid of. And then the LDL, um, large LDL, large particle LDL, gets oxidized into a smaller version of the LDL um, apolipoprotein. And it's considered more of a damaged, you could think of it as more damaged LDL. It's a more unhealthy LDL. And we're going to go into why that is too later on. Another point we want to make as insulin resistance, and we're talking about all these things in, in the light of insulin resistance here, which is a result of hyperinsulinemia. These are like two different processes, but the ultimate um, final product, uh, the final event here is insulin resistance. The other issue here is that triglycerides, um, the extra energy is also those that are not taken up by the HDL molecule are stored into visceral fat. In other words, that's the final place that this energy is dumped for storage. So energy is storage, stored in the form of glyco triglycerides and into visceral fat. And that occurs by what we call de novo lipogenesis. In other words the body starts making fat. And it makes it in the visceral organs. This is around where the um, intestines are and around the pancreas, things like that, around the, the central abdominal organs. And um, this is called central obesity. And de novo lipogenesis is under the control, as we've said before in our earlier talk, it's under the control of insulin. And again, our, our point being that insulin is a hormone. It's a hormone that regulates blood sugar, but it's also a hormone that regulates fat metabolism. Now, just to, just to, to throw in a couple of things for you, just 
for knowledge base, and I think it's really interesting, is that uh, insulin also stimulates ovarian testosterone production, believe it or not. Well, you, and you think, why is that? Well, remember, insulin is a hormone. So <clears throat> in women, you see an increase in ovarian testosterone, and um, that is one of the root causes of polycystic ovarian syndrome. You see women with hyperinsulinemia and um, effects of testosterone. And that's, again, why you're, you're, you're ending up treating polycystic ovarian syndrome with metformin. Another interesting thing to me is that this insulinemia, hyperinsulinemia, also is affecting the brain. The neurons in the brain, in effect, become insulin resistant just like the body does. Isn't that fascinating? And... This is uh, begin. This this results in a decrease in what's called cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. There is a measurable decrease in the amount of sugar that the the, the neurons will use as they become more and more resistant to um, the insulin. And this is why you have things like myocognitive impairment. Um, and, a progress, and a progression from this to uh, Alzheimer's type dementia, which is now increasingly being known as diabetes type 3 because, uh, as we said earlier, uh, the, the um, association with diabetes and dementia is really, really strong. And it's you know, it's one of those light bulb moments, I think, or at least it was for me, you know, when you start seeing some of the dots get connected of what this metabolic syndrome really means, of what hyperinsulinemia, this hormone really is doing, not just, we, we usually think of it in just in terms of a blood sugar issue, but it's a bigger, it's a bigger systemic issue. So, so patients that are, that are hyperinsulinemic, that may have some memory problems. Obviously, this is um, this is a manifestation of insulin resistance. Another thing to to be aware of is that um, as insulin resistance continues, there is an enzyme in the brain, and it is called insulin degrading enzyme. And as insulin levels are increasing in the brain, this enzyme is there to get rid of the hyperinsulinemia. So you get a depletion in insulin-degrading enzyme. And when that occurs, you have an excess of beta amyloid. Why? Because insulin-degrading enzyme is in charge of degrading excess insulin, but also it degrades excess amyloid, but it gives priority to the insulin. Just like insulin gives priority to the, to the sugar. So insulin um, degrading enzyme gets depleted in the setting of excess insulin, in other words, hyperinsulinemia. And when that occurs, um, you see um, excess beta amyloid. Now, the excess beta amyloid is seen in some patients with uh, Alzheimer's and seen um, in other patients that don't have excess beta amyloid. That's another talk for another day, but um, what many people are finding these days um, is that the old theory of beta amyloid is not really the root cause, and that's why, because we see a whole bunch of Alzheimer patients that don't have beta amyloid. But it is interesting that the excess amyloid plaque there is really um, due to insulin degrading enzyme depletion. And that is a symptom really of the resistance that's occurring and the declining metabolic rate of glucose. In other words, these cells... These neurons are, are really getting starved for energy. So we're going we're gonna to leave there. I just wanted to whet your appetite a little bit about the, the systemic effects of metabolic syndrome.
And um, one of the things in metabolic syndrome was hypertension, elevated blood pressure. And I always had to think about that. And I wanted to also whet your appetite a little bit because insulin resistance um, also um, stimulates aldosterone. It stimulates uh, an aldosterone effect <clears throat> and that leads to salt and water retention. And this is a very um, strong association um, between high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, hyperinsulinemia also affects vessel wall hypertrophy. Uh, arterial walls become thickened. And um, arterial wall glycocalyx here, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on too, um, is actually oxidized by insulin exposure. So um, this exposes endothelial tissue to damage as well. So hyperinsulinemia not only affects multiple organs, but it affects the arterial wall in a very unique way. And as doctors, I think we really want to be, um, we really want to appreciate this too. Um, there is sympathetic nerve activation with hyperinsulinemia. We know this, blood vessels become narrowed. And there is an inhibition of nitric oxide, and uh, blood vessels don't dilate as well. So all of these things contribute to uh, increased blood pressure elevation, as well as the unhealthy changes that we are going to discuss in the LDL, triglyceride, and HDL, and how they impact the arterial cell wall as well. So all that being said, metabolic Insulin resistance syndrome, otherwise known as Syndrome X, otherwise known as metabolic syndrome, otherwise known as diabetes type 2, is something that we ought to think about as a big syndrome. And it has a whole bunch of, it has a spectrum. And that spectrum of severity really depends on whether there is insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. Insulin sensitivity will be manifested in low levels of insulin or low fasting insulin, and insulin resistance will be manifested with levels of high fasting insulin. Okay, so there's your metabolic syndrome. Again, low one thing, HDL, and high everything else, triglycerides, glucose, blood pressure, and weight. And we want to make the point that the root cause is hyperinsulinemia, not hyperglycemia. And then just another um, chart just to show you all the different um, progressive diseases and how these are associated with progression of hyperinsulinemia, whether it's mild cognitive impairment, the prediabetes, the pre-obese, or the prehypertension, or the full manifestations of those things, and including other things, too, which we'll touch on in, in uh, subsequent talks. There's a strong association with chronic kidney disease here, uh, eye disease, fatty liver disease, gastroparesis. Uh, there's an inflammatory process as well um, that goes on with this, as well as peripheral neuropathies and strokes. All of these associations have insulin resistance as a component of their disease progression. So when we're looking at labs and we see a pattern of hypertriglyceridemia with low HDL cholesterol and possibly someone who's hyperglycemic right there, you know, those are three of the five criteria for metabolic syndrome just from looking at that lab right there, you know, and uh, not to say if the patient is obese or anything like that. So one of the things to remember when you see the triglycerides and the HDL ratio like this, really high triglycerides, low HDL, this is a, this is a red flag. It's a marker for insulin resistance, you ought to think to yourself, hmm, my patient may be getting insulin resistant, regardless of what the blood sugar is. 
It's the insulin resistance I want to worry about, I want to think about before any of those diseases start occurring. The blood sugar can be irrelevant in this case. Okay? They can be a normal glycemic hyperinsulinemic patient. Okay? So we're going to get into this a little bit more. Don't, uh, and I'm sorry if it, it um, is, uh, we're dragging here, but I wanted to make uh, some, some points here. Now, let's take a look at the metabolic impact on the lipoproteins. And let's take a hypothetical example. If two patients come in and they, have, they both have LDLC values of 130, the question is, is, do, bo do, do both of these patients have the same metabolic risk? And we're, we're sort of used to looking at um, the lipids in terms of what LDLC is. And one of the points we're making here is there's a, bigger, there's a bigger picture in terms of the metabolic health when we're looking at the lipids. So let's just see how valuable it's going to be looking just at LDLC. Well, one of the points that we've been making from the previous talk and a little bit of introduction in this talk is that as the liver gets flooded with sugar and glycogen storage, storage is maximized and now the liver is kicking out excess amounts of triglycerides and it gets packaged into uh, VLDL to begin with. And now we, we see this picture of the VLDL metabolism um, as it goes along, it's giving off um, triglycerides in the form of free fatty acids. And as more free fatty acids are given off to get rid of this triglyceride or to diminish the triglycerides, uh, let me say it that way, um, the the, apo the, the lipoprotein begins to shrink, okay? Now, all of this stuff is being carried in ferry boats. You can think of it as um, these apolipoprotein Bs or the ApoB lipoprotein system, okay? So, as more and more triglyceride is unloaded in the form of free fatty acids as these bo boats come into harbor around the body, this big boat, the VLDL, gets smaller, and that um, goes into a large LDL particle, okay? And then it goes into a mid-size LDL particle as it unloads more and more of the triglycerides. We're trying to get rid of it. And then as, as time goes on, it, it unloads more triglyceride, more free fatty acids, and it gets smaller and smaller. So the boats get smaller as we unload the cargo. So... Currently, unfortunately, I'm so sorry, is that when we order our blood tests these days, all of these things are just reported out as LDLC. Now, LDLC does not take into account whether they're large particles, mid sized particles, or small particles. And as we're going to talk uh, later, it's the small LDL particle that's really the problem with the arterial cell wall. LDL, large particles, are very fluffy. They're very light. Think of these as like beach balls that are floating in the water as these, as these boats uh, travel. I mean, if you, they, they, don't, they float. They don't sink to the bottom. The small LDL particles are very, it's like, uh, they're like uh, little bowling balls. They will sink to the bottom of the lake. This is what attaches to the arterial cell wall. So a lot of times when we, you know, I kind of smile to myself when we're chasing LDLC, and uh, that might not tell us the whole story. LDLC is just a composite um, estimate. It has nothing to do with drilling down to what the real problem is. All right, so we'll just uh, give you a mental picture of that. So during the metabolic process, the LDL apolipoprotein molecule, uh, uh, lipoproteins get smaller and smaller. They get smaller and smaller due to, si due to, the, due to the, the, the size. And they also, over time, these small LDL particles 
are more vulnerable to oxidation due to hyperinsulinemia. So they, get, they can get damaged as well. Another point I wanted to make before we move on, depending on how much energy the liver is trying to get rid of, the liver may make a whole bunch of triglyceride. And when the liver dumps out its increasing numbers of triglycerides, the liver has to package it into more and more and more VLDL uh, apolipoproteins. And then that results in larger and larger numbers of LDL, and that'll result in even larger, larger numbers of small LDL particles. Okay, so the number of the small LDL particles is a function of how much energy the body's got to get rid of. And the more of these small LDL particles that you've got at the end of the day, the more vulnerable this population is out here to the oxidative process of hyperinsulinemia and just the mathematical possibilities that more and more of these things can attach to arterial cell walls that are oxidized and damaged. So you've got more potential mischief here, more potential uh, problems due to the size of the particle and the numbers of the LDL particle. Okay, a real, real important concept. I'm going to make this two or three times so that everybody kind of feels like they, they, they have that. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to this. Um, so in our hypothetical patient here, we have two patients, and both of them have LDLC of 130. Okay, here's one patient over here with LDLC 130. Here's another patient over here with LDLC 130. This patient over here has more large LDL particles. This patient over here has more small dense LDL particles. So both of these systems are carried by apolipoprotein B. So the fewer the particles, the less risk the patient has because the risky particles, again, if we've been saying, are the small dense LDL particles. So this patient here has an LDLC of 130, total, total cholesterol of 198. And notice that cholesterol is really irrelevant in our energy model here. That is not what is driving the particle number. It is the triglyceride that is driving the particle number. Our triglycerides here are 90. Our HDLC is 50, which is a pretty good number. It's a higher number. And our non-HDLC is 148. Now the non-HDLC, again, corresponds to all of the apolipoprotein B systems, including VLDL. So when we have a whole bunch of uh, VLDL being thrown out, that is a contributor to this number. Okay, so it's not that high. So the, the liver now is able to package the triglyceride in an appropriate amount that does not downstream lead to excess small dense LDL. Now, over here, metabolically, this patient has, again, an LDLC of 130, the same as this guy. Total cholesterol, again, irrelevant. This is 210. But the thing that is driving the whole thing of the apolipoprotein B system is, again, the energy, the triglyceride. So the triglycerides here are elevated. And... The non-HDLC is 180. This is high. Again, we are making lots of VLDLs. This is going to correspond to LDLs. And as they're metabolized, more and more of these particles, you're going to get a larger number of small LDL particles left over at the end of the day. And that's what you're seeing here. You are seeing LDLC here, triglycerides here, HDL is going to be low, but we're going to have, and in contrasting to this, this is telling us most likely that we're having increased amount of small dense LDL cholesterol. Why? 
again, because triglycerides are elevated and we're, we're, having to dis, we're having to export a lot of energy. And all this energy is causing, as more and more numbers in this particular patient, greater and greater numbers of VLDL. We're going to have greater and greater numbers of large, den, of large LDLs, again, which aren't bad. And we're going to have greater and greater numbers of small dents, which will be a risk factor. So again, this is telling us that um, just focusing on LDL-C doesn't necessarily um, predict risk. And then you're saying to yourself, well, look, this is all I have. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Well, you can do one of two things. One, you can get advanced lipid... Oops. <laughs> you, Let's see, where am I? Sorry. <laughs> so you can get advanced lipid testing. And this is something I'm going to show you in a minute. And that will break down the large LDL and the small dense LDL for you. Now, not all the insurances cover it. Some patients, you might want to talk to them. There might be an appropriate time to get it. But again, liver glycogen is maximized. Excess glucose converts to triglyceride. The triglyceride energy is exported and then re-imported to and from the liver. The VLDL, which is non-HDLC, increases. LDL small dense increases. Triglycerides are increased. Apolipoprotein B system is increased. And HDL is damaged in the process to try to mop up all the excess triglycerides. So you can either get advanced lipid testing or you can take a look at your triglyceride HDL ratio. And that tells the story. And in general, you want that, I believe, under 2, as I remember. Yeah, less than 2. Um, some people even say less than 1.2 or something like that. But in general, for my practice, I always look at this ratio. And if it's less than 2, um, I feel like we're doing pretty good metabolically. Cholesterol, which is total cholesterol, is just a passenger. And LDLC is is mainly a function of, of fat intake and cholesterol intake. That has nothing to do with this energy pattern here, though. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a, uh, later on down the road. But I wanted you to see this, again, from a different perspective. Um, both of these patients have LDL-C, LDL cholesterol, of 130. Now, when you do your advanced lipid testing, they're going to call a predominantly large LDL pattern, pattern A. And then the, the, the patient who has a predominantly small LDL cholesterol pattern, they're going to call that pattern B. Pattern A with the larger cholesterol, large LDL, is a lower risk. The small LDL has a higher risk. And we're going to talk about that too. But I just want you to get a sense that just looking at LDL-C is not really drilling down accurately until the, um, about the patient's metabolic risk. So now that we've sort of thrown some of this up into the air going, oh my goodness, what's going on? Or, or, or I've either scared you a little bit or I've made you really, really interested. So let's talk about oxidative stress a little bit more. Now, we made the point that as VLDL gets made, it gives off triglycerides, it's being metabolized, that we're getting rid of free fatty acids, uh, we're getting rid of triglycerides in the form of free fatty acids, let me say. And so this is part of the metabolic process as the liver begins its export business. And uh, this is this is the the metabolism in of of how you get LDLC because as all this gets metabolized we're measuring LDLC over here this is through the apolipoprotein B system but the other part of this system is the reverse because remember i said the liver's running an export import business so the import business is that you've got HDL here in the apolipoprotein A system 
picking up all the scavengered um, triglyceride in the form of free fatty acids. So the HDL is your scavenger out there making sure you're not wasting triglyceride. And that brings it back to the liver to get repackaged again, and then the whole cycle starts again. It gets repackaged out there in VLDL. So there's a supply and demand going on at the muscles, and then there is a supply problem, you know, an oversupply of energy coming in from the liver. And so basically this cycle... um, continues to conserve energy from the apolipoprotein system, the um, HDL. Now, um, HDL gets consumed during this process because, again, it gets oxidized by the triglycerides, and it gets triglyceride, it gets oxidized by hyperinsulinemia too. So that's the reason that the HDL is low in this metabolic syndrome, Okay. Now, I want to think about um, the hyperinsulin spikes because there is a lot, I mean a lot, of research being being conducted right now on hyperinsulinemic spikes and their effect on the endothelial cell wall, believe it or not. Now, this little picture, I couldn't resist. There, Oh, we're blowing. Oh, just like the, the wind makes the waves. Oxidative stress is sort of like the waves pounding against this wall here, like the arterial wall. And this oxidative stress, uh, in other words, if you have a big insulin spike at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're asking, you know, for, for whatever, you know, particularly carbohydrate intake, if you have a if you call if you have a big carbohydrate bolus at breakfast, or lunch or dinner, you're gonna you're gonna stimulate your pancreas to release the insulin, and that's a phase one insulin react uh, um, response. Usually within the first ten minutes is a phase one insulin response. That insulin is dumped out there to immediately control um, the the sugar, and then there's a phase two insulin response that takes three or four hours later because the liver, the uh, pancreas beta cells have got to make insulin from scratch. So. Um, you've got an you've got a um, big bolus of uh, insulin potentially that has to control this um, this uh, postprandial blood sugar, and um, you may be making a lot of insulin three or four hours later after the meal just to control things. So um, there is endothelial. Um, um, manifestations or, or uh, there's sort of a uh, result of of um, of all this and what happens is is that the endothelial cell wall is made up of a glycocalyx a tissue glycocalyx and it is a protective layer and uh, this uh, insulin oxidizes that uh, in certain areas and um, it sort of shocks it and uh, it exposes the endothelial cell let's take a look this is a um, micrograph slide of a cross-section of an arterial cell wall, and you see these little hair-like things like this? Okay, that's tissue glycocalyx, and um, this is a blow-up here, a cross-section. Here's the endothelium, okay, endothelial cell, okay, and this, these hairy-like things are tissue glycocalyx. And what does that mean? Who cares? Well, tissue glycocalyx, if I had to describe it, um, and I've, I've used this analogy before, but have you ever gone fishing and felt a fish like that you just caught and um, how slimy the fish is on the scales? So, And if you leave the fish out in the sun, he's not going to be slimy after a while because the sunshine is going to dry him out. So what gives the fish that slimy, that slippery feel? It's glycocalyx. Believe it or not, the fish on the outside of the fish, they have the same thing. They have a, they have a glycocalyx on their scales, and that's makes, that makes the fish really slippery, makes it easier for them to swim. There's less resistance. And the tissue glycocalyx makes it easy for blood uh, cells to be shot through the arterial cell wall with much less friction and much less uh, red blood cell damage. So tissue glycocalyx is really, really important. And it's like 
hasn't really been talked about in the literature because it it's only been recently understood about all of what tissue glycocalyx does. And this will be for another talk, but, you know, inside the tissue glycocalyx, did you know that um, there is an um, angiotensin receptor, a uh, protein receptor, you know, just like you have in the lungs? Isn't that cool? You know, so in the arterial cell wall, you've got an ACE receptor protein, just like you do in the lungs. And a lot of people are looking at that receptor protein is, you know, we were talking about coronavirus. Coronavirus can bind here. And uh, it's a thought that that would stimulate um, an inflammatory response in the arterial wall and maybe lead to um, some people having more problems with, um, with blood clots and uh, vascular damage than other people. Um, okay, so in any event, we're talking about tissue glycocalyx, and this is what is oxidized in certain arteries of the body, and it's really important um, in the arteries of the heart. This is what leads to arterial wall plaque. And uh, we'll talk about that on another session too, but just the overview. So if you have an LDL pattern B, if you have a lot of small, dense um, LDL particles, these are the particles that are associated with, um, if you have this pattern and you have a pattern, uh, you have an, a, a situation where you have hyperinsulinemia, where you have tissue glycocalyx damage, then what you've got is um, a space in the arterial cell wall where you begin to expose the endothelial cells to the small dense LDL that sit and that, that have much higher affinity for the endothelial cell wall than the large particle LDL, which is the pattern A. Okay? Now, um, believe it or not, the lipoproteins also carry vitamin E inside them. And vitamin E... Um, acts like a hormone and a vitamin, which is another talk for another day as well. But isn't it interesting that um, there is an inflammatory component to this process as well? And um, the as the small LDL uh, particles begin to attach and begin to make their way in between the endothelial cells, it sets up an inflammatory response. Macrophages are drawn into this area, phagocytize the small dense LDL particles because they think this is bacteria. They get faked out and they start phagocytizing this and then they become foam cells. And then these foam cells direct all kind of an inflammatory response in the subendothelial tissue. And then you start seeing calcium being being brought in with fibroblasts and everything else. Okay, so you've got oxidative damage, you've got an inflammatory response in association with high insulin levels, which are exposing tissue glycocalyx, exposing the subendothelial layer after glycocalyx damage. Okay, and so again, this is all associated with a meal that is high in carbohydrate, which is stimulating the hyperinsulinemia to start with. And this subendothelial dysfunction, again, contributes to the um, lack of nitric oxide, inability to vasodilate, and then that also contributes to hypertension. Again, looking at this from a different way, we've got oxidized LDL, damaged LDL, which is small, dense LDL, and it in the, in the setting of tissue glycocalyx dysfunction due to hyperinsulinemia, small, dense LDL can, can um, begin to penetrate the endothelial cell wall two different ways. One, the endothelial cells will begin to sort of 
through pinocytosis it kind of comes through, but also they get a little bit leaky because they've been exposed. They're not as protected from tissue glycocalyx. And then as the small dense LDL make their way through the endothelial cells, they get to the subendothelial layer and they, um, they form these complexes and then you have an inflammatory response. So uh, hyperinsulinemia is, uh, again, one of the biggest um, oxidizers here. There, there are some other things that, that smoking contributes to something like this. Inflammatory states contribute to something like this. Um, but uh, hyperinsulinemia has, um, by and large, been, it's, it's a really huge component of this. Okay, so are our two patients that were presenting with LDL-C values, do they have the same metabolic risk? Well, let's look at advanced lipid testing. Now, this is my lipids from 2020. I'll be the guinea pig here. I got this so that I could maybe show you guys what advanced lipoprotein testing looks like. And so this is the NMR, advanced lipid testing. When you get this um, test back, you'll see it as a document in Athena, but they do give you a little website down below. And if you copy that website and put it in a browser, um, the lab gives you this. The lab gives you something nice and pretty that you can look at. You can print this off for your patients too. It's a little bit easier to read. But the big thing to notice that, you know, what I look at first is the LDL particle number. This is a number, more and more particles carry risk. So you want lower particle numbers because, again, that, that sort of um, is a picture of how much energy you're trying to get rid of. And so I hope that makes sense um, in light of all the things that we've been talking about. So you want a lower particle number, and that's... That's good. So, and they, they, it's really nice of the lab. They put the, the good numbers are in green and bad is red. So, whew, I, I'm glad I'm in the green, okay? So that's good. Another helpful number, you know, is small LDL particle numbers. So you don't want a lot of this. Remember we were talking about small LDLs? So my number was like less than 165, which is really, really good. And I'm happy about that. And so that's... Um, so the particle number here is important. The, the, um, the small LDL is really um, an important number as well. So both of those are key numbers. And then um, we like to look at the HDL particle number too because that's your protective. The more of that that you've got available, and see for me, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm doing pretty good over here. But that tells me that I'm not using up my HDL molecule, um, apolipoproteins. I'm not using them up. My APOA system is healthy because I'm not using up HDL because I don't have a whole bunch of excess triglyceride out there, okay, um, that, that needs to be brought back, imported back to the liver. And uh, so, you know, just looking at my regular numbers, um, I had a total cholesterol 145, triglycerides were 66, not too bad there, and then my um, HDL was 80. So, so those are good numbers, and my LDLC was 52. Again, LDLC, if we just look at LDLC, it's not telling us the true picture of what's going on. Now, you don't have to do advanced lipid testing like this. What I think, you know, is just important, if even if... You, the research shows, and this will be a talk for another day as well, but the research shows that there is much more cardiac predictive risk if you look at the ratios as compared to just LDLC. And we did make this point in the last talk as well. So if, if you didn't see the last talk, you go back. We look at several studies, um, four or five, I believe, that, that compare looking L, at LDLC versus at looking at um, triglyceride HDL ratio, and also there's another ratio of total cholesterol HDL ratios. So even if we didn't do advanced lipid testing, just looking at the ratios based on the regular lipids would tell us the metabolic story. Okay.
So that is the end of the talk for part two. So stay tuned and look at the next um, talk. It's going to be um, nutrition concepts part three, and we're going to go a little bit deeper as to how you can help your patients. So for me to all of you, uh, thanks for watching. I hope it was helpful.